So welcome everybody. See, I'm Doug Elliott, Ken Krause, and um, and uh, I just thought while we're here, we might as well just talk about a few of the plants that are just right here before we start into the woods. And so like right here, we got plantain, broadleaf plantain. And you know, this, this is a classic, you know, we come, sometimes we call it nature's band-aid or we call it the bee sting plant. And uh, if you get stung by a bee, or even poison ivy, things like that, you make a poultice. If you want to make a poultice, probably the ideal way would be to gather a whole bunch of these fresh leaves, take them in, put some spring water in your blender, blend it up till you had a puree, and you'd apply it. All of a sudden, all of a sudden, you got this kid going, ah, I got stung, ah, what do I do? You gotta make an emergency poultice, right? <laughs> Chew it up, lay it right on there. It's amazing how fast it'll take away the sting, you know? And, uh -huh. So the kid gets so weirded out that they like to forget about their sting, you know. <laughs> <laughs> and that's part of it. But um, but but it it is an edible plant, and you can you can take it and saute it a little bit and kind of stir fry it, and and it makes a fair edible. To me, it's not something I eat a lot of. But but if I'm on a camping trip or something and don't have a lot of other greens, this might be one of the ones I'd pick. You know, and all, it's called plantain, plantain, plantago, um, broadleaf plantago. And it, you know, the, the, it's it's often called. It was called by many of the natives. It was called something that translated out to mean white man's footprints, because it was one of the first plants that showed up from Europe. It's a European plant, and it takes over wherever. You see, it's competitive wherever the ground has been kind of worked on. You know, it's been been trod upon. So it's the kind of thing you find in a in a school a schoolyard. You know, where where um, there's lots of there's lots of lots of little feet pounding away along the edges of the road. See, it's not competitive back in here because it's shady and a lot of other things growing. But out here, it can take it. None of the other plants can take it, but it can. So you see it growing all around here. And then right, right here, we have violet leaves. All right, and violets, violets are also edible. And uh, again, again, you know, the, the tender and the younger, the better, but they're pretty mild. You can, you can add them to salads, or to me, they're better, better like steamed. Also, also for skin, skin things. And they're, they're very mild flavored, even this time of year. So. If we already wanted some greens, we could probably get some of them. All right. So we so we go back into the woods here a little bit. Anything we need? Uh, I mean, I guess. Oh, let me let me just do one here. This is this is an Appalachian riddle, and the riddle goes: crooked like a rainbow, teeth like a cat. You can guess all day. Can you guess that? Crooked like a rainbow, teeth like a cat. Can you guess all day? Can you guess that? Smilax. There he is. He's speaking Latin to us again, isn't he? All right. And if we were speaking English, we'd say Greenbrier. All right. Catbrier, Greenbrier. And here it is. Crooked, well, sort of like a rainbow. Teeth, well, sort of like a cat. You know, sometimes they call this plant blaspheme vine because when you get caught into a thicket of it, you're prone to blasphemy. <laughs> but if you're there in the right time of the year, and it's the early part of the summer and late part of the spring, it produces a new tender tip. And even though this thing is just thorny and nasty and just terrible to get caught into, the tender tip is tender and delicious. And, uh, and you can just pick them right off. Sometimes we'll get whole bunches of them and take them and just, just chop them up and put them in a salad and make a big salad out of them. Sometimes we eat them just right out of the woods. You know, and so soon, if you, if you happen to be caught in the briars and they have the new briar tips, soon your blasphemy will be turned to hallelujahs and you'll be grinning like a mule eating briars. <laughs> <laughs> so, so and, in, and here we got, this is the, the invasive bittersweet, beautiful little, little berry that, that has an orange, she a yellow shell and an orange berry in the middle. And um, it's, um, it's, it's, an it's beautiful but an incredible pest, very invasive, just taking over many, many areas in the southern Appalachians and many parts of the... And speaking of other invasive, here's another, the, the privet. So, all right, all right. So I just wanted to say a couple of things about collecting mushrooms, uh, just a little bit of instruction, kind of the tools of the trade. If you've got one of these, you're serious about collecting mushrooms, that's for sure. Uh, but a knife of some sort is a really good thing. Um, show them your knife, show them, show them what it has on the back end of it. Why? So, it, actually this, this is also for cleaning. And so, you know, it's really great for uh, picking edibles because you can cut it off at the base, right at the ground level, and then pick it up and brush everything off of it and keep those separate from all your other collections. If you're collecting mushrooms to just bring in for identification, 
then sometimes you'll tend to just have a bunch of different things with dirt on the bottom. It gets down into the gills. It makes it really difficult to clean when you get uh, back. So one of the things I like to do is um, I bring a lot of these little wax paper bags for two reasons. One is if it's a specimen that I want to take in for study, I don't want to damage it in the process of getting it back. So I'll take it and place it in here and close it up like that. And that kind of protects it, put it in the basket. And then when you get back, you'll have a nice specimen. The other is for the edibles, I'll just put this in one corner of the bag. And as we find the edibles, we clean them in the field. The more you clean them in the field, the easier it is when you get to the kitchen. And so then um, um, you keep them separate that way. So recommend that. Uh, another option would be using uh, alum I mean, uh, wax paper. You can pull it out and whatever size you need, rip it off and make a little mummy out of it to protect it. And for those little bitty things that you want to bring in mostly for study, a little tackle box is great. You can put all those little things in here and they don't get all crushed up and mixed up with everything. One other tool that's really useful for mushrooming is a hand lens. There are a lot of the details, the little finer taxonomic details that you can uh, actually see in the field. You need something to be able to pull it in really close and magnify it a little bit. So using a, a hand lens is a, is a really good idea. So um, when you're collecting a mushroom, it's very important that you collect all of it. So if it goes down to the surface of the leaves or down into the soil even, just kind of scoop under it and pull it out. Because if you don't do that, sometimes the, the most important characteristics that you need for identifying that mushroom are right at the very base of the stem. And if you break that off, then there's no way that you'll ever be able to uh, definitely um, identify that mushroom. So. Um, try to get all of it down to the bottom. You don't really have to do a whole lot of digging, but uh, usually if you just kind of scoop under it, you can lift it right up. And you can use a, a knife, or if you don't have anything, just use your finger. Um, that'll work as well. So we'll kind of move along through the trail here. If you find mushrooms, uh, if you want to collect one specimen and bring it to me so that we can see, um, if it's an edible or not, and uh, whether we want to, to collect more, uh, that'll be good. We're going to pick something to eat, then eventually we do cut off the whole thing. Right? Absolutely, yeah. But, but when you're collecting it, it's best to go ahead and get the whole thing, and then we'll, we'll clean it and then kind of put those together and uh, hopefully have them in our meal this evening. Yes? Okay, even if they're edibles, we're probably not going to bother with them if they have wormholes, right? Yeah, well, depends on your maggot tolerance. <laughs> Some people, you know, if it's if there's a little a few tunnels, it's not so bad as long as the mushroom is still pretty fresh. But if it's starting to to show any signs of decay or decline, then it's better to toss it. Yes, that's true. Well, let's see. Our trail starts up here, so we'll just we'll just go across the creek. 